Hello, this is John Milburn for Laws 12060. This is Trusts. We're into week 10. Tonight we're dealing with trusts for commercial purposes. So we've got a few things that we want to cover. We've got a number of people online. Thank you, as always, for joining us. And um, last week we talked about legality of trust. So tonight we're talking about, in more depth, how trusts are used in practice. In some ways, this is a revision of what we did in an earlier part of the course, where we talked about the different types of trusts, Express trusts, we're back, we're finished with resulting and constructive, we're back with express trusts, but essentially how we use express trusts in the context of commercial dealings. So you'll recall from um, earlier discussions, we talked about the use of discretionary trusts or family trusts, unit trusts, superannuation uh, trusts, testamentary trusts. So we're kind of covering some of that again. So a person who consults you in business as a lawyer and says, I want some advice in relation to the structure, will probably be working with you in conjunction with an accountant. That would be the normal situation. And between the advisors, you might look at the um, legal and the economic, the accounting aspects, and come up with a decision to go with one structure or another. So some of the structures might be a sole trade, or it might be a partnership. It might be a company, it might be a trust. So they're the, the basic range of normal structures for um, a small business. So we know that a discretionary trust is a document that, um, sorry, a discretionary trust is a trust that's established through a document. We know all about the set law, providing funds, um, establishing the trust with a um, some sort of initial contribution. Can, te- can anyone tell me in the context of you're a solicitor or uh, giving advice to an accountant for a client um, who says, look, we're going to set up a discretionary trust. Um, who would you who would you nominate as a potential set law for the client, and w- what would you say is an appropriate settlement sum to kick the the trust off? Any thoughts? Unmute or use the chat facility. Oh, and my internet connection is unstable again, so I I do hope I don't drop out. Fifty dollars says Brad. Have we got any advance on fifty dollars? Yeah. Yes, Linda. Yeah. No, that's what I read was $50 somewhere. $50 and Sophie says 10 Yeah, look, back in the 70s, uh, no, early 80s, about 82 when I first started, um, it was 10 bucks. But I, I think I wrote in the note 50 um, just to allow for some inflation. And what actually happened? Is there a real $10? Is it, is it true? Is there actually $10? It is. It is. So... Well, yes, Brad? Oh, sorry, I just said it has to be the first transaction and the accounts. Exactly. So we used, um, to set up, we, used to, we used to set up just a separate account with the amount in it and then set up a different trading account so the settler sum did not disappear into a negative. Oh, okay. Yep. Now, that's that's a, a very safe approach. Um, I certainly endorse the fact that it's got to be a settlement sum. It's got to be actual cash. So you'll see the trust deed is um, signed and the $10 or $50 or whatever it is, is actually physically attached to the outside with a direction, all right, to the trustee. I want you to open a bank account and I want that deposit to be on its own as the very first entry. Uh, Brad suggests two accounts. Um, typically the ones I've seen, it's the one account which just ki- rolls on from there. But it's a real thing. So we want to make sure that the trust is properly constituted. So th- we're talking now about a discretionary trust, but the same rule applies to a uh, unit trust. So trusts are very often the preferred mechanism for a commercial venture. Um, a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight, in, to a degree we've, we've touched on earlier, and there's not a lot in the textbook, so um, we're covering a bit of ground tonight. So why a discretionary trust? Um, Well, we know a discretionary trust is one where the trustee has a discretion as to where the income and capital should go um, on an annual basis, typically. And beneficiaries, we know, have a right of expectancy, but a mere right of expectancy to be considered in the context of a potential beneficiary, but no expectation of actually being the beneficiary or one of the beneficiaries. So the rights of the beneficiaries are different in a discretionary trust than they are in a different type of trust. And people will often use these sorts of commercial trusts for a number of different things. Flexibility is one, Um, maybe capital gains tax, maybe transfer duty, maybe um, 
advantages relating to income tax and asset protection. So there's a whole range of reasons why people might use a discretionary trust ahead of, say, a company or um, partnership or, or some other form of more direct um, structure. But as we talked about in the last few weeks, issues to do with primarily Commonwealth legislation do get in the way of these things. So you'll recall that we talked about the Bankruptcy Act and we talked about the Corporations Act and we talked about the um, Social Security Act as all examples of um, Commonwealth legislation that to a degree intrudes upon the pure basis of, um, for creating these discretionary trusts and a reason why the discretionary trusts are probably, I would say, far less popular now than they were when, um, when I first started in the early 80s. So um, in pure legal logic, if you have money that's in a trust, it's protected from creditors. Likewise, in pure legal logic, money in a trust is protected in the event of a family law dispute and in pure legal theory, money in a trust does not form part of your estate or your assets for social security purposes. But there's been big inroads and I won't go through that again, but just be aware of that requirement. All right, so again, I know I'm covering some ground pretty quickly, but we've covered it before. A unit trust is kind of a structure that lends itself well, I think, to two groups coming together in some sort of venture. You could have a joint venture, you could have a company, you could have a partnership, but a unit trust provides a lot of advantage and flexibility. And essentially, we establish the unit trust in the same way we do a discretionary trust, really. We open a bank account, the unit trust will, like a discretionary trust, have a tax file number. Um, they're not separate legal entities, mind you, uh, these trusts, but the trustee in its capacity or her, his or her capacity as trustee is a separate legal entity. So a bit of a fine line there. But we set up the unit trust and what does it do? Well, it provides fixed units, typically, which are owned by separate discretionary trusts. You can have as many units as you like, really. Some people might have two, others might go 128, but they tend to be something that's kind of divisible down the line in case people want to split their share. So if you start with two units, you really don't have anywhere to go if you want to split it between a son and a daughter, for example, in, in an estate situation. So something like 128, you can divide it down to 64, 32, and so on. Um, so the units are, ho are owned by individuals. The units in a unit trust are owned by companies or, as is very often the case, they're owned by discretionary trusts. And I say discretionary trust, what I really mean is the trustee of the discretionary trust. Okay, I'm really flying through this because we've got a lot to cover. Have I lost anyone or are we all okay? It's all good? Less than 20 unit holders for an unrelated parties. Thank you, Brett. Very good. And you've got to be careful about prospective requi prospectus requirements if you're um, dealing with something other than in a, um, a, a you know, a, a private setting. All right. So the nature of unit holders' interests was considered in a High Court case of Reed, R-E-A-D, against the Commonwealth. The citation for that is 1989, 167, 57, at 57, sorry, at 61, 62, the court said this. A unit holder has a beneficial interest in the assets of the trust, a right to have the trust executed in accordance with the deed, and a right to proportionate distribution of the proceeds representing the assets of a trust fund upon termination of the trust. The extent of the unit holder's beneficial interest at the, the given time is that proportionate which his or her units bear to the total number of units issued. So that's kind of, if you like, an official definition, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. Now, the trustee of a unit trust will often be a company, and that company will often be controlled by the people that are ultimately behind the business or the joint venture. So you're adding degrees of protection in terms of assets um, and flexibility in terms of ownership as well. So companies, of course, endure indefinitely into the future, as opposed to people that pass on. 
So if you have things set up in a company structure, it makes estate planning easier too, or it makes the sale of property or in the sense of it being a trust property easier as well because it can continue on. It, um, it's just a, the personnel change behind it, but the structure remains the same. A bit like football team or something of that nature. Okay, so we know the basic structure of, say, unit trust with discretionary trust sitting under it, and that's very common. We know that all of these things rely on a trustee running the show and a set law setting the things up. We know that there's a trust deed. Um, we know there's a settlement sum. Now, in a trust deed, where do we see the actual reference to the set law, the trustee, the settlement sum, the amount of the settlement sum, the date of established in the trust? Rad's given us an answer. I'm not sure necessarily schedule two, but a schedule. It's very common in the trust deed. So there's two ways of drafting the trust deed. One is you can actually interpose all this information within the document, but very common, as Brad says, to have a schedule. So you have like a pro forma, precedent um, document with all the variables in the schedule. You'll have some nomination of the parties on the front page and the signing page, but for ease of reference, you just look to the schedule and you'll see all these things listed. That's typically the way these things are drawn. Now, we've talked about the appointor, and you'll recall that the appointor has a very important role to play in these trusts as a, as a party that has the ability to nominate a fresh trustee, and um, uh, nothing changes in that regard. All right, so we know about the benefits of a discretionary trust in that one of the great advantages is the ability to distribute funds amongst, say, family members to provide the overall maximum tax benefit. And we heard that, that, that that's always under review. So um, that has been, um, oh, and Brad says, have an additional appointor or who's not a beneficiary. Um, and it's always a, a situation where the tax department or government generally, I shouldn't say tax department, but government through legislation may attack the way in which these trusts are used in the future. But that's kind of a, a general way of looking at trusts as a way of minimisation of, um, of taxation. Okay, um, but as I said before, a trust is not a legal person, a company is a legal person, a trust is not specifically a legal person. The trust relationship is, um, is a fiduciary relationship. So the trustee has obligations to the beneficiaries um, and is not a separate um, individual in that sense. All right, so just as revision, what's discretionary when we talk about a discretionary trust? What's discretionary about it? Okay, we've got a response from Brad. Any others? Okay, so Melissa says, who gets the income and the capital? We'll come back to you as Brad. Erin says, if and when beneficiaries get anything. Linda says, trustee can decide who meets the requirements set out in the trust deed. These are all good answers. Brad says, um, where is yours, Brad? It's gone. There's so many answers are coming in now. Brad said as to income and capital rights. Yep. Okay, so the discretion from the point of view of the trustee is to distribute income or capital or both to beneficiaries, but always, first place we look is at the trust deed, then we consider the Trusts Act, then we consider case law. After that, we consider uh, the writings of, um, of academics. Okay, so there may be some advantages in terms of um, trusts providing benefits to deal with income assets. So we know about the appointor, um, setting up the trust, having the ability, if you like, to nominate another trustee in certain circumstances. Okay, so your client comes to you and says, all right, well, that sounds like a good idea. Um, I would like a company and I'd like a discretionary trust. How do you 
go about actually making these things happen? Firstly, the company. Where would you look typically to deal with a company? All right, so Sophie says ASIC, Australian Securities and Investment Commission. Brad says uh, ASIC. Mine's actually, no, no, mine's oh, Australian Axis. company. What's Axis. Australian? Axis. What's that? Axis. I don't know the biggest, uh, um, they um, set up companies and deeds. They're a document process entity, the right. biggest one in Queensland. A shelf, shelf, company, shelf company dealer. Erin says the Corporations Act. So... Um, there are shelf companies um, and companies that set up these documents. Um, and uh, certainly back in the 80s, we, we physically used to set up companies in the, in the law office. People don't tend to do that anymore in the law offices. It's very quick now to set up a company. It, it used to be quite a laborious process and it would take time. So that's why we'd literally have these companies sitting on the shelf ready for people to buy. So, now it's a pretty easy process. It's a pretty quick process to set up a company and uh, it's a matter of nominating essentially the names of the um, directors and the beneficiaries and uh, the beneficiary would be um, the individuals behind the company. They, well, sorry, they would be the shareholders, I'm sorry. The shareholders would be the people behind the company. If you were going to set up a company with a discretionary trust as a business entity, how much money would you encourage the clients to put into the company as a general rule? How much would you use to, to set it up? What would the shares be worth at first instance? I like Brad's answer. Very close to my heart. Melissa says a dollar. Erin says a dollar. Brad says enough to cover my fees. Sophie says $10. Okay. Again, oh, I'm sounding like the old days here tonight, but back in the old days, you had to have um, two directors. Uh, now you only need one director. Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing is, um, you know, it used to be that you'd have two shares, each worth a dollar. So people would talk about a $2 company probably heard that saying before. But the point is that you wouldn't put much into the company. And the idea is that the company is the vehicle by which decisions are made. The company is the trustee. So the people behind the operation control the company, but it's the company that makes the decision. So the company is the trustee. And what you really want in order to generate the, the most value from the uh, discretionary trust is if you're going to set one up, the business operation or the investment or the, um, uh, the ownership of shares, or whatever, should be in the discretionary trust. So that's where you want the real value to get the benefit of the discretionary trust. All right, so when you're setting up the company and the trust, you'll probably acquire a company that's already set up off the shelf or you'll quickly incorporate a company um, for the client's and you'll set up a trustee. So a lot of these things are pretty much pro forma. As Brad said, Brad said you can outsource it and get um, a company to do these things for you, or you can actually do them yourself if you want to. So uh, that's really what you need to do. Once you've signed the document, once you've got the settlement sum, you then open a bank account, get an ABN, um, register as a group, group employer, as the trustee for the um, the trustee for the trust. So if the trust, whether it's a discretionary trust or a unit trust, acquires property or a business, how would you, as the legal advisor, tell your client to, to designate that? How, how would the contract for the purchase of, say, a business look when, they, when you said purchaser? What would you put in that column? Okay, good. We're getting some good answers and they're quick. Melissa says company is trustee for the trust. 
Brad says, in the name of the company as trustee for. Linda says, company. Sophie says, company name as trustee for. So I like, yes, you've identified that it's the company that is the legal owner because that's the nature of trust, isn't it? The trustee is the legal owner. Um, but I think it's good practice to go further and put as trustee for and then name the trust. See, because every time when you set up these trusts, it'll, you'll give it a name. And it might be the Smith Family Trust or it might be the um, ABC Unit Trust, but it'll have a name. So you'll have a, the name of a company as trustee for whatever name trust. And you don't have to use the words discretionary trust or unit trust, but quite often you do. But sometimes people put in family trust as a name when they're talking about a discretionary trust. So what happens if by mistake or perhaps um, wrong advice, somebody puts the name just as the trust, as the buyer of the business, the Smith Discretionary Trust. Well, it's not necessarily fatal. You can get around it, but it's, it's sloppy. It's not accurate because the trust is not a legal entity as such. So you may need to supplement that by way of explanation that it was in fact the company that purchased the item or the business as trustee for the Smith Family Trust. All of this should be documented by way of minute and supported by actual payments. So make sure that you have your paper trail correct and you have it documented in an appropriate manner. After that, it's pretty simple. In practice, um, the business operates as any business would or the investment property operates by, by leasing the property to, uh, to a tenant, for example. Um, all the accounts are maintained in the name of the company as trustee for the trust. Um, it has its ABN, it registers as a group employer, all those sorts of things. So once you're into the swing of it, it's just like owning the property yourself, if you like, but with those taxation and legal advantages that we talked about um, from the start. Okay, so asset protection, it still helps, even though there are intrusions through the Bankruptcy Act, the Family Law Act, the Income Tax Assessment Act, the Social Security Act, there are still advantages to having the um, asset in a company name, especially a company as trustee for a family trust. Can you give me any example of a client that may come to you and say, I would like you to provide a vehicle that maximises the ability to minimise, sorry, maximise the ability to minimise, provides a, an opportunity for us to minimise the taxation uh, incidence of this operation, but also provide some security. What, can you give me an idea of a typical client that might be in that category? I think there's a few answers coming through. Property developer, yes. Okay, so maybe a professional, um, maybe maybe a, do a doctor comes to you and says, um, you know, I, I, I want to protect myself as well as I can against a uh, malpractice suit. I don't think it'll ever happen. Bil builder, says Sophie. So there's a whole range of people that are involved in business or professions uh, and they want the benefit of um, um, asset protection. Now, I've sort of identified one thing, for example, a negligence claim that might be brought against that person. Now, that's not going to be covered by any issues to do with Bankruptcy Act, in Income Tax Assessment Act, Family Law Act or Social Security Act. So there are plenty of opportunities to gain benefit from asset protection is really the point that I'm making, despite the intrusions of the Commonwealth legislation that I've referred to. Right, any questions or comments? And thank you for your contributions tonight. It's been very good. No, Maria, do you have any questions or comments? No, no? I'll just get, might get you to mute your microphone then, Maria, if you don't mind. Oh, all right. So, sorry. Well, no, that's all right. Um, so will this be on the exam? Um, look, probably not to the same degree. Um, it may be referred to, but this is kind of a bonus week a little bit because it's not really covered very well 
I'm sorry, I shouldn't say not covered very well in the text. It's not covered very comprehensively in the text. So this is kind of the um, how do we do this in practice type deal. So not so much the theory. Okay, so we know about um, income. So we know about asset protection. Yes, Linda. No, no question from Linda. Okay. Um, I was just going to say, John, if the others want to read, I. No, no. You're right. Can't hear you there, Linda. Sorry. It, I don't know about others, but I, I couldn't was, hear it. Yeah, I was just going to share with the others. I joined that Jay Barnett, like you said, to get subscription, and we got one down on Monday that actually covers what you're talking about and the problem question about um, beneficiaries paying back. So if the others wanted to read it, it actually shows how the developers use a company inside another company and the trust has to pay that company. So you That's have right. to pinpoint everyone. But that was that Colin R. Price and Associates Proprietary Limited. The decision only came down on the 12th of May. So it's, it's very current and actually touches on everything we're doing this week. Terrific. Great. I should have said it's on the exam then, shouldn't I, Linda? Would have been good. Um, yeah, but it's scored. <laughs> and look, if you um, if you would be kind enough to share that on you, crew, that would be excellent. So thank you for that contribution. And um, Linda's right. If you're not already subscribing to the Jade Barnett bulletins and getting the latest cases to your inbox every day, you're doing yourself a disservice. And it's a great way of a refresher too. You get the in, the cases come through. You get to read a short summary, and it just refreshes things in your mind. So. A lot of advantages in doing that. So that's Jade Barnett or Barnett Jade. I, I can't recall which way. They kind of go both ways on that one. All right. So we know that there are income tax advantages. Are there any income tax advantages to having a unit trust? We've, I've been kind of talking about income tax and discretionary trusts. What about unit trusts? It is a bit of a trick Yes, question. doesn't that allow them to um, filter down the payments if they're going to do income to tax advantage? Exactly, yes. So, And Brad, Brad identified the trust itself doesn't pay tax. What happens is that the trust is the vehicle for distributing and because we have the opportunity to um, structure the unit holding in the unit trust in the most beneficial way, we kind of get the benefits of the taxation issue at the discretionary trust level because it the money filters through the unit trust down to the next level, if you like. So, um, and the unit holder example that I've given consistently is a company as trustee of a discretionary trust. Okay, so there are some tax advantages there. Um, the decision ought to be made by the 30th of June each year in terms of where the money goes and um, it provides an opportunity for um, the asset protection as well. Okay, so we've talked about how we own these um, parcels of land or business or property, and we do it in the name of the company as trustee for the trust. All right? Very good. Now, what about testamentary trusts? What are they all about? And I'm saying this from a, a planning perspective rather than necessarily what has occurred as a result of someone dying. So someone comes to you and says, I want to set up a testamentary trust because I've heard that when I die, that will provide some substantial benefits to my family. Can you help with some advice? What do you say? It's, isn't it a discretionary trust that's established within their will? So they're giving like a further direction within their will what, what they want. Is that what it's to achieve? Close. It's not a direction within the will, but you're spot um, on with the rest of it. Yes, Brad? So um, I know of an entity whereby the um, shares in the trading business were then became the assets of a testamentary trust. So the business continued on because um, the assets of the trust 
were those of the shares of the trading entity originally. So um, it was a way to then um, generational hop. Yes, um, so that's good. Now I'm going to become just a little bit technical here, but but stay with me on this. It's not that hard. Um, the first is that when we talk about trusts and we talk about wills, there's kind of different meanings and different levels to this. So um, when I talk about a testamentary trust at the planning stage, I'm really talking about a situation where someone comes to you and says, posing that question I just did a moment ago, I've heard that if I set up a testamentary trust, my family will benefit. So in that sense, when you're preparing a will for a client, which is a testamentary trust will, as Linda identified, what you're doing is you're building, literally building into the will the discretionary trust that lies dormant until you die and then it comes to life. So a will that you might be used to seeing or maybe you've even prepared might be a page or two or three pages, maybe. That's kind of a standard will if you like. A testamentary trust will might be, I won't say one or two, three inches thick, but it might be 30 pages. It Because <laughs> Brad, Brad, Brad charges by the page, so his, his testamentary trust is like this. But <laughs> I'm sorry, Brad, I'm only joking, I'm only joking. Um, but a testamentary trust, the way I do them is, well, I used to, I, I, I'm, a, I'm not a solicitor now, so I can't, I don't do them. But when I used to do them, uh, they would normally be schedulized. So there would be a schedule to the will, which is the actual trustee that comes to life upon death. And so it may be that in the drafting of the will, if your client has, say, three children, you might say, all right, um, upon death, uh, I establish trust A, trust B and trust C um, for the essentially nominating as trustee child A, child B, child C upon the terms set out in the trust, which is in Schedule 1. So the testamentary trust that I'm talking about actually includes a discretionary trust in the document. Okay, on Brad's identified some advantages of uh, testamentary trust, spot on divorce, bankruptcy, tax, and social security. And the tax advantages are amplified in a testamentary trust based on current rules, but that can always change by the time other people see this video, maybe the rules have changed. But anyway, so that's what I mean by a testamentary trust, and it springs to life as a, as typically more than one discretionary trust, so upon the death of the testator, testamentary trust A comes to life, B comes to life, and, all, and C comes to life, all established within the context of this testamentary trust will. So the testamentary trust will typically will establish upon the death of the, the testator more than one actual trust. So then the child A goes to the bank and opens up a bank account, which is the testamentary trust A, child B, testamentary trust B, a different bank, different account, etc. And then those individual people get to use the advantages of having that trust um, uh, passed on to them. Now, the second issue, and this is really what I think Brad was, was talking about, is that it is possible to use the trust vehicle on an ongoing basis by distributing an asset in specie. So when we talk about a distribution in specie, what we're really talking about is something that has a certain form at death and it stays in that form until it goes through the estate administration process and it's still in that form when the beneficiary gets to use it. So an example of an in specie um, issue might be, I leave my house to my son. I leave my investment property to my daughter. What you've done is you've left them in specie. So they're not sold and converted to cash and then distributed in accordance with the distributions in the will. They go in as a house, they come out as a house. So they're distributed in specie. And people talk about in specie contributions to, you know, superannuation funds. So uh, they might say, well, I'm going to uh, provide these shares in specie into, into super. Um, 
So you can gain the benefit of keeping the trust as a trust and just changing the ownership through the will in much the same way that we, you can through selling it. Um, or you can distribute individual items to the beneficiary directly, or you can distribute individual items to those people to be held by them in a testamentary trust that you've established in the will. So in the same way that we talk about, you know, an accountant giving $10 to set up a, um, a discretionary trust or a unit trust, likewise, when we talk about these testamentary trusts coming to life upon the death of the person, um, what goes into them at the start is whatever that person left to them. And that person can leave them, this is typically what happens, a percentage share of the estate. I leave, I set up testamentary trust A, B and C equal shares, or you can actually leave individual items into those different trusts. I hope I've explained that. Does that make sense or have I just too many words to explain a simple concept? Can I just ask one question, John? Yes, sir. Um, you, you briefly mentioned superannuation. If you take, for example, a superannuation fund and you leave your will and obviously you have to nominate the people who are going to um, benefit from your superannuation, can that those funds in a superannuation actually be left in a trust as well once you pass away? Um, now, super is a little bit different. When it comes to dealing with your superannuation asset, if I can use that term, in estate planning, it's, tip, it's not something that you can strictly leave in your will. Um, you, you deal with superannuation a little differently. It doesn't technically form part of your estate. Um, so what you do is you, you nominate who you wish to be your beneficiary, and um, that will typically be what the trustee of the superannuation fund does. It may not refer to the will. It might say you've nominated X to be the recipient of your super fund, so therefore it goes to X. Or it may be you've nominated your estate to be the um, beneficiary of your superannuation fund, therefore it goes there. But ultimately, it's the trustee that has a discretion. So sometimes there are arguments. So if, no, if there is nothing in the will, uh, especially, or even if there isn't something in the will, the trustee can ignore that um, in the sense of not following it. They'll, they'll take it into consideration as part of decision making, but the trustee, you may have to have a separate argument in the Supreme Court about family provision and how the assets of the estate should be distributed properly. And you might have a separate argument with the trustee of the superannuation fund as to where the money should go. Now, in terms of avoiding capital gains tax, uh, an issue raised by Linda, Brad said, no, it moves, the CGT base is moved after, until later realised, only if you ensure you benefit under the account and balance transfers. Brad, do you want to just explain that? Um, okay, so with a self-managed superannuation fund, um, there's a number of, um, <clears throat> issues that can occur at death but um your deed you the the deed can sometimes allow for you to ensure your member benefit so if your member benefit was a million dollars this the fund takes out a, uh, an insurance policy for a million against the beneficiary the member that then pays out the million dollars to their estate but the super fund now has a million dollars which then moves to reserves which then can be distributed to the, by the discretion of the deed to other members of the fund. So that was in answering uh, Linda's question about superannuation, because generally it's not an estate asset pursuant to the nomination of the member. That's it. Thanks, Brad. So it's so does that mean... Yes, oh, sorry. Yes, Aaron. Oh, I was going to ask. So that, mean, so that means um, superannuation funds... Um, um, Parties to a will can't um, seek a family provision application for those then? Certainly in the family provision application, the court will take that into account, but st strictly it doesn't form part of the estate. It, it may do if the trustee um, of the superannuation fund chooses to distribute the money to the estate, then it becomes an estate asset. And they may choose to do that because the, um, 
deceased person may have nominated the beneficiaries being the estate rather than an individual. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, so Melissa said, why do people typically create a testamentary trust? Is it about trying to maintain control after death? Um, actually, that's a really good question. In my experience, no, quite the opposite. Um, usually people that, um, the, the, that I would establish testamentary trust for would be um, individuals of um, uh, considerable net worth uh, that wanted to do the right thing by their family and wanted to ensure that their family were protected um, in all sorts of ways. So it, and Brad says, because a lawyer can charge more for a TT, that's true, lawyers do charge. I certainly did charge considerably more for doing a testamentary trust. And you really, from an ethical point of view, you, you're silly not to, because if you're just treating it as a throwaway, you know, just um, a nominal fee, you're not really doing it justice. So um, that's right. Um, but anyway, I would normally, the sort of individual that would want a testamentary trust are people that want to protect their children. So, you know, let's say they come to you and say, look, I want a testamentary trust. Here are my circumstances. I'm, I'm now widowed. Um, I have um, three children. The first is married, but the marriage is not good. And I'm really concerned that he or she will lose money to his or her spouse if they separate. The second one, um, the child is, is uh, uh, in business, but the business is not going well. And I'm concerned that that um, child may go into bankruptcy or liquidation, or the company may go into liquidation. And I really don't want what I leave to go to creditors in, in that situation. I want it protected. And it may be that the other one, the third child, is um, on long-term social security and I don't want to uh, upset their social security entitlements by directly giving the money. Now, of course, in all of these instances, there's a huge proviso, and that is you've got to look at the Bankruptcy Act, Corporations Act, the uh, Tax Act, and the Social Security Act. But that's generally the sort of um, situation where people are not so much wanting to control things after death, but actually make sure that people get the most benefit. It may be that there's a fourth child. The fourth child is doing great. The fourth child is uh, in a stable marriage, has great kids that are doing well, has a good business, lots of income, uh, leave the money in a testamentary trust for them so that they can maximise the taxation advantages of having the trust. So um, it may be a lawyer. Is it a lawyer? Probably not, Erin, um, sadly. But it, it the, the idea of the testamentary trust is a little bit like the other forms of commercial trust in that you're really providing an opportunity for some degree of asset protection and some degree of uh, asset maximisation. So Brad says, stable for now until the windfall comes in. Yeah, true. All right, so some good questions there. Now, when you're setting up your discretionary trust, if it can go right back to, to the start, um, who would you nominate? in the document as the beneficiaries and would you establish different classes of beneficiaries? What am I establishing the discretionary trust for? To make my unit trust or... No, just, a, a, just, just an ordinary old discretionary trust for somebody who's about to go into business, they're, they're going to buy their first um, franchise. So Aaron says classes, if it has lots of capital and property. Any other comments? All right. Typically, what we say, oh, yes, Brad's got it. Brad? Uh, yes, yeah, so normally you'd have the primary beneficiaries would be the um, probably the parents and their direct children. Then you have secondary would be other parents. Tertiary would be um, a dumping entity, so another company. Um, and then there would be generally a default provision as yep. to and to find who the default beneficiary would be in the absence of primary, secondary, or tertiary. Yeah, charities, for etc. So that's right. So it typically you'd actually set it up, but you'd see that if you can come across a precedent for a, a discretionary trust, you'll see that built in. So, you know, I talked about a schedule where it'll have the name of the settlor, the name of the trustee, 
the name of the trust, the settlement sum, the date of establishment of the trust. It'll have the names of the primary beneficiaries, mum, dad, the kids, secondary beneficiaries, tertiary beneficiaries, charitable beneficiaries. So um, that's all typically in a schedule to the trust. All right, now I've run out of time, um, which is a good thing because I was only going to mention perpetuities again. I'll mention this. Perpetuities drives me crazy. Um, if you read section 209 of the Property Law Act, I just think it's really, I think, it, I'll put it this way, I think it needs a redraft. Is that charitable? Um, what, I, what I think you can take of this in English is that the period of perpetuity cannot exceed 80 years. If it does, the general law um, position applies. So what that means is the general law rules that a trust must not exceed further than 21 years after the date of a party who was alive during the period of when the trust was created. So at the end of the 80 years or earlier, the trust will vest. But what you can take from it is it, the period of time in the trust deed cannot exceed 80 years. Otherwise, you then have to look at the general law. So you don't want to look at the general law. Then you're talking about uh, 21 years after the death of uh, lives in being and all that sort of stuff. So I think the, 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 and the whole of um, the property law act says, Brad. Um, so I think the general rule to take about that when you get to the part about perpetuities is just stick within 80 years and make it easy for yourself. All right, the duties of trust. Um, yes, Brad. Um, just um, on the problems for this week, um, I know the first one was about pretty much what we've been through tonight, but the second one in regards to primary and primary trusts and secondary trusts um, and the cases of um, uh, the um, educational um, entities, is that the sort of thing we may need to know or are we skipping this whole week for the exam? Um, I... I didn't write the questions, they were inherited with the course, So, um, but I did write the exam and I wrote it some time ago. And to be honest, I can't specifically recall a question to do with the commerciality of trusts. So I think you can pretty safely assume this part is not strictly going to be in the exam, but it's kind so of John, what you need to know. So John, would you like to refresh your memory prior to um, fulfilling your statement to the courts today. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I hope I haven't said something contrary to that. And I will, I will look at the exam again because in week 12, we're going to do a review. So by then I will definitely be on top of what's in the exam and I can give you some better advice as to what will be there. Oh, quick close crust, quit, uh, trust. Let's not do that. Um, Oh, and by the way, I'm well and truly into the marking process. There's a lot to mark. Um, I normally aim to have it back to you on the Sunday um, following the final cutoff, but it's going to take me a few days longer than that. So if you don't get the results until maybe Tuesday or Wednesday, um, don't be overly concerned. But overall, what I've read so far, I like. So thank you. All right. So I've got to go to this other session. Um, I think we know what units are. I think we know what unit trusts are. The only other thing is there's a thing called hybrid trusts. I don't like them, but they do exist. And it's a way of incorporating features of discretionary in unit trust. My view is just do them separately and save yourself a whole lot of problems. But they do exist and some people really like them. Okay, well, I better go. Thank you very much for hanging in there. And um, we'll see you next week. All the best. Bye. Thanks, John.